We are back on the Rational Boomer podcast. Hopefully your day is going well. It is Saturday. Friday was a little busy, not as busy as we'd like. There were no indictments from Jack Smith regarding the January 6th investigation, but it's coming. Trust me on this. They are coming. I can't tell you when. Will it be next Tuesday when the grand jury finally reconvenes or will they do it Monday? Who knows? But nonetheless, it's coming. And Fonnie Willis's indictments are coming in the next week or so, too. So it's going to be busy. It's going to be crazy up in this bitch. <laughs> now, when I promoted the show yesterday, I said that Ed would be on the show. And never fear, Ed is going to be on the show. But we had kind of a weird occurrence. So the way this podcast will play off will be different than we normally would see if Ed was here doing the podcast. Ed and I sat down uh, early in the day yesterday, as we normally would. Ed's old, so he can't stay up late. So we do it earlier in the day. And we started recording. We got through the first half. The first half was long. It went about 50 minutes or so. And we were about ready to start with the second half. But then the power went out. All the power in this area went out. And I told Ed, I said, look, we went 50 minutes. I don't know when the power is going to come back on. So let's just leave it at that. I'll do the first half talk about stuff that happened after we talked and we'll just do it that way because we are uh, improvisers. <laughs> so Ed said that was cool. You know, he put in his 50 minutes. He was probably fucking winded at his age and uh, he went his way and we'll be back Thursday to talk and hopefully we'll be able to do the full show. Interestingly enough, after I did that, I had to wait for the power to come back on to get to the video and do what I need to do with it. So I took off. I went to the store or something. Traveling up the road, maybe a half mile from here, I see why the electricity went out. Apparently, a pickup truck hit a power pole, broke that power pole right off its base, and took down the power. And that's why we had the problem. But I'm looking at this. This was one of those wood poles, those big ass wood power poles. And this truck hit it hard enough where it literally broke it off and was just laying there. Fucking crazy. My experience in traffic accidents, and I've seen many as a former traffic reporter watching cameras. I, I don't know how a guy does that and comes out of it uh, clean. I'm not going to say there was a fatality because I don't know that. And the way things were being worked around there, it didn't look like it. If there had been a fatality, they would have shut down the roadway. So thankfully, there wasn't a fatality. But you can't get away from something like that, seeing the damage to the truck and uh, the pole being knocked down and not have some injuries. Hopefully, the person is safe and and, and well and getting attention and, and getting better. But you cut off my fucking power, bitch. Don't do that again, especially when I'm in the middle of a podcast. So I'm going to do the first half here. We're going to take a break. And then Ed and I will come back for the second half. But that was about 50 minutes. So it's almost all we needed to do with Ed anyway. So that works out perfectly. As I said, there were no indictments today, yesterday, actually. Probably won't be any today because who's working on Saturday besides me and you? But anyway, so maybe Monday, maybe Tuesday. Nonetheless, it's coming soon. I have some emails that people sent to me. First one comes from Jeff from Ohio. He says, hey, Mike, I know you will have Ed on tomorrow, meaning today, and won't read any emails on the air, but even though I understood what you were saying, I think they have a solution. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. I think that's adorable how you folks actually notice different uh, uh, trends in the things I do, <laughs> my, my habitual things I do. When I have a guest on, I don't typically read the emails mainly because I I just think it's kind of rude to have a uh, have a guest there and say hold on don't say anything I got some emails to read as much as I like reading the emails I don't want to rush through them 
and I want to be able to spend some time with them. And I feel kind of weird about it if I have a guest. But since I'm done with Ed and it's just me here, I can read the emails. Now, what what Jeff is talking about is what I was talking about with uh, with regards to uh, Diane Feinstein. She's having some cognitive problems. She was in in the Senate and she was asked to vote on something and she stood up and started a speech and somebody said, "Now nah, you just have to say I. And, and so she's going through some things and she should retire just like Mitch McConnell should retire. But as I said, one of the problems that would occur is that the governor had made a promise that he would appoint a woman of color if the opportunity should arise. And that poses a problem to the people in the Senate, people like Nancy Pelosi and other folks like that, who really want Adam Schiff to win the election. They're going to support him going into the election. And they're concerned that if he appoints a person of color, a woman, and she is the incumbent come 2024, that that would give her an edge to win and Adam Schiff couldn't go in. I mean, I say play it however you want to fucking play it. It should just be fair. But, you know, whether it be in politics or in jobs, it's always they're always game in the system. I'm sure you've been through this. I've been through this before. Where you're going for a job and you have to interview. But you know that they already picked who they want to hire. They're just doing the procedures so they don't get their ass in trouble. I've even been the guy that they were going to hire. I had a job and and uh, then they had to restructure it. And then I had to interview for the job I'd had for 10 years. I knew I was going to get the job, but they still had to interview a bunch of other people and act like, well, you know, if we get a better applicant, you, you, you might lose out on the job. Bitch, I invented this job. I've been doing it for 10 years and everybody loves me that I'm doing it. You really think you're going to find a better applicant than me? I'm not saying they're not good, but I've got a specialized experience in the very fucking job that you're hiring. So that game gets played all the time. I've been in it. I've been on both sides of it. And that's the game they're trying to play there. Now, Jeff seems to think he has a solution to this. He says Governor Newsom can appoint Adam Schiff to the Senate. Then that leaves his spot vacant in the House, which they can fill with a woman with uh, of color, as you say. Just my simple ass thinking. Now, that's thinking good. That's not a bad idea. Appoint Adam Schiff and then appoint a woman of color, a man of color, whatever you want to the House of Representatives. That's a little different than what he promised, but uh, it may be a loophole. I don't know. We'll see what happens. I have a feeling they're going to try to see if they can get uh, Dianne Feinstein to hold on for 16 months, but that's asking a lot. I mean, what, she 90 years old? She was out for three months because she had shingles? For God's sake, there's something more going on there. And now she's in the Senate. She doesn't know where she is and what she's saying. I mean, at the very least, at the very least, you would have to think, wouldn't you want the best possible people representing their districts or their states instead of worrying about this power play? I don't know what they'll do, but they may be forced to do something because, you know, when you're talking about somebody like Mitch McConnell or or Diane Feinstein, who who the fuck knows? I mean, people who are 81, 90 years old, shit happens. They can keel over on the Senate floor and nobody would be surprised because of their age and their 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 health conditions. And then what do you do? I'm not sure how this is all going to play out, but something needs to be done because if we're going to pay people to represent us and expect them to do the best job, they better be cognitively proficient. They should be able to think and do things and not worry about them following, falling and getting sick and all that kind of stuff like with Mitch McConnell. So we'll see. We'll see. But your idea, Jeff, not a bad idea. I wonder if they considered it. All right. The 
Next email I have is from James. He says, hey, Mike, does anyone know where it is written that a former president is afforded unlimited Secret Service protection, even if they're convicted of a felony? So if a former president becomes a serial killer and is arrested and convicted, he is entitled to Secret Service protection. This is bullshit and needs to be addressed immediately. I get sick and tired of hearing people say they can't assign Secret Service to a prison detail if Trump is convicted. Another question I have is, if he is convicted, will he still collect presidential pension? He should be treated as any other civil servant who is convicted of crimes related to their employment, no pension, and no longer able to hold public employment. Lock him up. Where is it written that he would still get Secret Service protection even if he's convicted of a crime? I don't know, but I'm willing to bet it's never been written anywhere because nobody ever expected a situation like this. People just presumed a president would be relatively uh, honest and law-abiding. I, you know, I don't know. Maybe it is written in there, but you're absolutely right. Um, you, you, you don't need to, uh, uh, if you've got somebody who committed crimes while they were in office, whether they're a politician or any kind of government uh, employee, uh, they they can lose their pension. Now, will a president? I don't know. Will he get Secret Service? I think he will. Um, and, and I've heard people talk about it and say, you know, basically Secret Service agents are on for eight-hour shifts. Their eight-hour shift would have to be in a fucking prison. I suppose that's possible. I think I said to John John uh, uh, Colbert when he was here a couple of days ago, maybe I did, maybe I said it to him off the air. I, I don't remember, but I, I've said this before on the podcast. Well, you don't want to send uh, perfectly innocent uh, Secret Service uh, to jail with Donald Trump. That seems kind of weird. That seems kind of harsh. So I thought, well, given who Donald Trump is and who he represents, maybe they could just farm the job out to the uh, to the uh, Aryan nation inside <laughs> inside prison. I mean, th they got to love this motherfucker <clears throat> and he got to join a gang anyway to stay safe. So let him join the Aryan nation. See how they like that. See how he likes that. James, thank you for the email. I appreciate it. And now that we're talking about Donald Trump being in jail, Donald Trump on Friday promised that if he is convicted of a crime and sentenced to prison, he will continue to run for president. Well, of course he will. What the fuck else does he have to do? I mean, he's betting on a Hail Mary pass. His only defense in his court cases, I mean, they're so cut and dried. There really is no defense to most of his court cases. The only hope he has is that he runs for president, he wins, and then he pardons himself or he works some kind of deal to get out of this mess. That's his only option. And uh, that option offers slim to none op options. The guy's not going to be elected president. Even if he wasn't in jail, he's not going to get elected president. So he's got hope in one hand and shit in the other. And he's going to have to eat the shit because there is no hope. Uh, John Fredericks, Fredericks, the host of a pro-Trump talk show. You got to wonder, you know, I'm doing this podcast. I do what I do. If you're a guy that does a TV show or radio show or a podcast and it's pro-Trump, what are you going to do when he finally gets convicted? You're going to have to change format because that's not going to go very well. Well, he asked Donald Trump whether a conviction resulting in a prison sentence would stop his bid for a second term as president. And Donald Trump, of course, said not at all. There's nothing in the Constitution to say that it could. Trump replied, even the radical left crazies are saying, no, that wouldn't stop. And it wouldn't stop me either. Now, 
legally speaking, Trump is correct. The most famous example of an incarcerated person running for president is Socialist Party nominee Eugene Debs. He received a million votes in 1920 while he was imprisoned for his opposition to World War I. He didn't win, of course. Now, there is something to consider. If he gets convicted of a crime, can he still run for president? Yes, unless one of those crimes is connected or somehow tied to the 14th Amendment. If he's convicted of crime where the 14th Amendment comes into play, then he would be precluded for running for any office ever again. So it's not an absolute for Donald Trump. And, you know, I have a feeling that Jack Smith is thinking about this. And some of these recent um, recent indictments and charges that were set up would tie in with that 14th Amendment, and he would not be allowed to run for president. So, Donnie, if you think you're going to jail and you're still going to run for president, maybe, but probably not. Now, this is what I love about the media. It says, it is unclear what would happen if Trump, while incarcerated, Trump won while incarcerated. However, since there's no precedent for that occurring in a major federal election, some scholars have suggested that he could pardon himself immediately upon taking office. Why are we even fucking talking about that? He cannot win whether he's in jail or not. He's not going to win. It is a, the longest shot there could possibly be, and it's not going to fucking happen. But, of course, the media has got to talk about this to make everybody nervous. Oh, my God, Donald Trump will go to jail and he'll be president and he'll pardon himself. That's not going to fucking happen. He's not going to get elected. It's just, it's just fucking ridiculous, to be perfectly honest with you. Now, we know about all the corruption and criminality <clears throat> in the Supreme Court. I mean, it's a fucking mess. All six of the conservatives in the Supreme Court are uh, corrupt one way or another, or just inept, incompetent, stupid, or criminal. They all are, all six of them. And there's something we need to do something about this because without a credible Supreme Court, it's really tough. It's really tough to maintain a democracy. We have three branches of government. That's one of them. If one of them falls down, and it certainly has, we got a problem. And it's a problem that we've got to fix. Now, in the House of Representatives, there are some Democrats trying to cobble together a bill. And in this bill, it would hold Supreme Court justices um, accountable for the things they do. Clarence Thomas and Alito specifically have some things they need to answer to. Apparently, they're willing to take bribes and sell decisions, which is the exact opposite of what you'd expect from a Supreme Court justice, especially a Supreme Court justice. So these Democrats in the House have gotten together and they're trying to put these bills together to make them more accountable, the Supreme Court justices, and maybe even have a code of ethics. Oh, code of ethics. <laughs> That's a novel idea. Judges having a code of ethics. Every other federal judge has a code of ethics, but not people in the Supreme Court. Well, Samuel Alito, Sam the Sham Alito, heard about this going on in Congress, and uh, frankly, he wasn't feeling it. And he said this. He said, no provision in the Constitution gives them the authority to regulate the Supreme Court, period. He told a pair of interviewers for the business paper's opinion section in a, peer, in a piece that appeared Friday. He said that Congress does not have an oversight role over the Supreme Court. What? Really? I mean, in the Constitution, it very specifically says that the uh, Congress can impeach 
a Supreme Court justice if they find it necessary to do so. I don't know about you, but that that sounds like fucking oversight. I mean, I have to believe Samuel Alito knew that. He's a fucking Supreme Court justice. And uh, AOC and some other reps talk shit about the judge. I think AOC said, imagine that. <laughs> a guy who's in charge of enforcing checks and balances doesn't believe checks apply to him. <laughs> and then she ended her point by saying, too bad. I love AOC. You don't want to fuck with AOC. I'm just saying. Anyway, uh, Ted Lieu also said, uh, Judge Alito, you have to remember, the only reason you have a job here is because Congress expanded the court to nine justices. I mean, this is also conservative, also trump -la fuck Republican. They know something's not true, but they throw it out there as if it is in hopes that dumb people will believe it. Well, dumb people will believe it. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the people in this country have average or above average intelligence, and they know bullshit when they see it. And this is unadulterated bullshit. Now, Donald Trump on Friday questioned the special counsel's authority. This is hilarious. I got two interesting things to talk about. Um, Donald Trump is clearly fa flailing about these imminent indictments coming from the January 6th committee, and he thinks he's got it all figured out. Wait for this. Donald Trump on Friday questioned the special counsel's authority in investigating him in connection with his efforts to overturn the 2020 election. He says he's already been tried and acquitted for the crime. Probably saying to yourself, what the fuck does he mean by that? Well, this motherfucker's flailing. He will try anything. I told you he would do this. See, what he's suggesting, he's talking about the impeachment. Now, the House of Representatives impeached him the second time for this January 6th, inciting the riot and all that kind of stuff. They impeached him in the House. But when he went to the Senate to stand trial in the Senate, the Senate found him not guilty. And of course they did because the Senate was Republican controlled. So he thinks that because he was cleared in the Senate, that he can't be tried in justice, in the justice courts, because <laughs> of double jeopardy. <laughs> Donnie, you were the fucking president of the United States. Are we to believe that you don't know what the fucking deal is? Congress, the Senate. That's not the judicial system. That's totally different. The fact of the matter is, is Congress can't really do much to anybody if they impeach him other than kick him out of office. And the Senate would have had to do that. But he's really trying to play this like they can't charge him with the January 6th stuff because he was already cleared by the Senate. Sorry, Donnie. I hate to disappoint you. That's not how it works. And as former president of the United States, you should fucking know that shit. Now, in a social media post, he suggested his acquittal in the impeachment precludes Jack Smith's probe. It's a lot like Alito. You would hope he knows better than this, but he's going to throw it out there because he's got to take a wild ass chance. He's got to throw a Hail Mary and hope people will fucking buy into it. But again, nobody with an average amount of intelligence would buy into it. But it's hilarious that he's trying this. Trump earlier this month received the letter from the council's office that he's the target. So he knows he's going to get indicted. But this is what he said on True Social. How can deranged Jack Smith bring a case on January 6th, as ridiculous as it is anyways, when I've already won such a case and been fully acquitted in the U.S. Senate? <laughs> wow. That is stupid as it comes. You know, I, I, I thought Donald Trump was dumb. But when I look at something like this, I realize he's either horribly desperate or he's horribly dumb, or a combination thereof. 
Donnie, let's see how that works for you. See if you're going to get off the hook because you're already acquitted in the Senate. Nice job. Now, Donald Trump is still back in the courts. Um, you remember when Donald Trump wanted to take the Manhattan District case with uh, Stormy Daniels and the hush money and all that stuff? For whatever reason, he wanted it moved to a federal court because he was president, even though that had nothing to do with him being president because it all happened before he was president. Well, he took it to an appeals court and he lost his, or he took it to court and he lost. So what's he going to do now? He's going to fucking appeal it. Trump asked a federal appeals court Friday to reverse a federal judge's decision to keep his hush money criminal case in New York state court that the former president claims is very unfair to him. Well, of course he does. Now, Trump's lawyers filed a notice of appeal with the Second U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in Manhattan after U.S. District Judge Elvin K. Hellerstein last week rejected his bid to move the case to federal court, where his lawyers were primed to argue he was immune from a prosecution. Didn't we go over this a long time ago? Donnie, you're not immune. You're not the president anymore. When this happened, it was during the campaign. You weren't president then. It didn't work. It never worked. It didn't work in this case, but you still can't let it go. You can't believe you lost, so you're going to appeal it again. And you know what, Donnie? You're going to get your ass beat again, like you always get your ass beat. Now, U.S. law allows criminal prosecutions to be moved from state to federal court if they involve actions taken by federal government officials as part of their official duties. But Hellerstein ruled that the hush money case involved a personal matter, not a presidential duty. And if having sex with a porn star is a presidential duty, I haven't heard about it. Well, maybe Clinton, but not Donald Trump. It's not part of his job. Now, Trump's appeal notice came at the end of another busy week of legal action for the twice indicted Republican. He's looking to get back in the White House, and it's not looking good for Donnie. As I see Jack Smith do the things he's done, you know, the indictments and now the superseding indictments, bringing more into this issue, the whole thing with the Iran document that he was showing to people and, and it was audio recorded that he said, well, it wasn't really a document. And then Jack comes up and says, I got the document. I got witnesses and I got you on audio tape. You're going to fucking lose this. Donald Trump will try anything, but God damn it. He's got to be just frustrated because none of it is fucking working. None of it is working. Now, um, on Thursday, he was indicted on a new criminal charges, as I mentioned, in separate cases. They were superseding the uh, classified document cases, and that just added to his problems. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office, which is prosecuting the hush money case and fought to keep it in state court, declined comment on Trump's appeal. Trump pleaded not guilty April 4th in state court to 34 felony counts of falsifying business records to hide reimbursements made to his longtime personal friend or lawyer, actually. And it was the $130,000 thing, and we all know about that shit. He's really pushing to get it to federal court. And, and to be perfectly honest with you, getting it to move to federal court really doesn't do him that much good. I mean, he's not in Florida here. He's in Manhattan in New York. It's a it's a liberal state. He knows that in Manhattan, he'll have no friends on the jury. If he gets it to a federal court, there would be a wider range of um, area for them to get jurors. So maybe, maybe he might get a friendly or two, but it's never going to be sent to the federal court because his point doesn't make any fucking sense. It makes no sense at all. Now, let's talk about Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump. Keep in mind, Donald Trump is ripping Ron DeSantis to pieces all the time. But Florida Governor Ron DeSantis doubled down 
on pardoning former President Donald Trump if he wins the presidential election next year. Now, why is he saying that when Donald Trump is talking shit about him? Because he knows Donald Trump will have to drop off at some point, and he wants to get Donald Trump's voters to vote for him so they can pardon their Lord and Savior. But what that's going to do is work against him if he ever got to the general election. But as I've said about Donald Trump, there's no way he's winning the presidency or even getting to the general election. And Ron DeSantis has less of a fucking chance. He's sinking every day in the polls. He's doing stupid shit and saying that he will pardon Donald Trump will just fuck him amongst the other things that will fuck him in the general election. So DeSantis was on the Megyn Kelly show and he said, well, what I've said is very simple. I'm going to do what's right for the country. I don't think it would be good for the country to have an almost 80 year old former president go to prison. It doesn't seem like it would be a good thing, he told Megyn Kelly. And I like I look at like, you know, President Gerald Ford pardoned former President Richard Nixon, took some heat for it. But in the end, it's like we don't we we do want to move forward in this country. Now a lot of people thought it was good for the country to pardon Richard Nixon. In retrospect, it really wasn't good for the country. It was bad for the country. It basically set up what we're now seeing with Donald Trump. You leave a president who isn't accountable for anything, breaking laws, lying to Congress, lying in the courts. When you don't make them accountable for that, uh, then somebody else is going to do it, especially if they have to be a very corrupt criminal, a stupid motherfucker like Donald Trump. He's going to take that opportunity and run with that shit. So, Ron DeSantis fucking up some more. It's not going to help him. As I've said many times, Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis, neither will be the Republican nominee, neither will run in the general election. And if by some chance they decide they want a third party and they want to be in it, well, that's going to be a mistake because that'll fuck over the Republicans. So I hope they do the third party thing. I mean, we're all worried about RFK Jr., and Joe Manchin, those two have no chance for it at all. Uh, I'm not even worried about them. But if Donald Trump runs or Ron DeSantis one runs, that will split up the Republican Party. So keep your fingers crossed and hope that happens. We're going to take a break here in a minute. And then when we come back, it'll be Ed and I. And that'll go for a while. So you'll get plenty of Ed in the second half of this show. I was just thinking about something. I was thinking about the story I told you yesterday, how there was a bit of a kerfuffle on the House floor between Eric Swalwell and Kevin McCarthy. It was a contentious time on the House floor, and Eric Swalwell was getting frustrated with Kevin McCarthy, and he says to him, you're weak, you are a weak man, and then Kevin McCarthy gets all frothed up and he says if you call me a pussy one more time i'm gonna kick your ass <laughs> and then of course eric swalwell not afraid a bit says uh you are a pussy and and frankly that's an accurate statement kevin mccarthy is the epitome of a pussy and he shows it to us every day as he bends over for maga but it got me thinking you know i i brought up the marjorie taylor green thing where she called Lauren Boebert, a little bitch. And I was thinking about how this body, this House of Representatives that we're supposed to respect, how it's degraded to something less than a dive bar with a bunch of drunken idiots trying to fight each other and not getting along. And I thought, if we're going to degrade it that far, maybe we should go the full route. Maybe we should put a uh, octagon in the rotunda and then promote some fights between Congress members. I mean, it will be embarrassing to the country, but at least we could get an audience in there. At least we could do a pay-per-view and maybe feed some poor people or, or whatever. I mean, can you imagine Eric Swalwell and Kevin McCarthy getting into the uh, octagon, getting ready to go? Now, my money would be on Eric Swalwell. He's younger. Um, he was in the military. 
He's not a pussy. So he would probably kick Kevin McCarthy's ass. What I would suggest to Kevin McCarthy is before you fight Eric Swalwell, you might want a tune up, maybe Logan Paul or somebody get a tune up so you can get your wits about you. Or what about, what about uh, AOC going after uh, uh, Lauren Boebert, a nice fight between Lauren Boebert and AOC. Now AOC is not that big, but she's wiry. She's kind of matrix wiry, you know? I bet she's got some ninja shit up her sleeve. That would be a good fight. Now the question is, who would fight Mitch McConnell? Well, after what happened the other day, just about anybody could fight uh, Mitch McConnell. <laughs> but we could throw Diane Feinstein in there and put those two elderly fucks and let them fight it out. I still think Feinstein would kick Mitch McConnell's ass. I'm just saying. I mean, she's got some cognitive issues too, but I think she's got a little more fight in her than Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell doesn't look like he's long for this world. In fact, on TikTok, I saw this, this hospice nurse. She had watched the video with uh, Mitch McConnell, and she said he's showing the signs of... Uh, of somebody who is near death because she's witnessed a lot of death. Now, I don't know if she's right about that, but she talked about the sunken cheeks, the eyes and the movements and stuff. I mean, all of what's gone on with uh, Mitch McConnell, I'm guessing he's coming close to the end. He's coming very close to the end. And you have to wonder what is with these people, somebody like Mitch McConnell or, Diane Feinstein or any of these other wealthy people that get elderly, get sick, and they still want to grab onto the money and the power. That's all important to them. But here's what I know. When you die, the money and the power, when you're in your last moments, the money and the power means nothing. You can't take it with you. All you really have left in your life is your memories and the legacy you leave. Now, there's a phrase that a lot of people use, and they use it incorrectly. They say money is the root of all evil, and uh, that's not the phrase. The phrase is the love of money is evil, is the root of all evil. And that's the thing about these people. They love money. They love the power. But the fact of the matter is um, money is an inanimate object. It's nothing more than a tool for us to survive. Being that it's an inanimate object, it's not worthy of love. It can't accept love. So these people are misguided at best. Wealthy people go after wealth and power because of their own insecurities or ego or whatever it is. But I always look at money, like I say, as a tool. And I'll give you this analogy. Say wealth is constituted by how much toilet paper you have, okay? Money is like toilet paper. And that's kind of true. It comes in, it goes out, it comes in, it goes out. Um, but anyway, it's like toilet paper in this respect. A wealthy guy might have 10 truckloads of toilet paper, yet he has only one ass to wipe. So what good does it do him in his life or after death or whatever? I mean, the important thing is, you got to be able to know when you have enough, when you're comfortable. I'm not rich, but I have enough. I live the way I want to live. I'm comfortable. I don't have the mess of owning a lot of toys and all that stuff. I don't want that. I'm 63. I want to pick up, go on a trip, go out to dinner, do whatever I want. As long as I have that going for me, I'm cool. But these people that continue to cling to power and money, in the end, I can't help but imagine that they are sorry about that in their final moments. They have to die realizing, I made the wrong choice. I was fucking wrong. And I guess that is essentially karma. All right. Now we're going to take a quick break, like we do. And when we come back, it'll be Ed and I for the second half. So hang on for that. 